Welcome to Conversations in North Dakota History, sponsored by the State Historical Society of North Dakota. I'm Virginia Heidenreich from the State Historical Society, and today we're talking with Dr. D. Jerome Tweeten from the University of North Dakota. We will be talking about North Dakota documentary film and photography in the 1930s. Dr. Tweeten, why don't you start out by giving us a little background about what prompted this thrust for documentary film during the 1930s? Well, it was obvious during the 1930s that the hardest hit areas of the country, the most depressed for a very long time, really beginning with World War I and the decline of agriculture then after the war, was rural America. Uh, there was a high degree of tenant farming, with the uh, 1934 and the 1936 droughts, much of the uh, farming community in North Dakota and in other Great Plains states was, I think we can say, essentially wiped out except for some areas. And so here was a, here was a clear area that, uh, that needed some kind of attention. Uh, and uh, Franklin Roosevelt moved very quickly to try solve the farm problem first with uh, AAA and some farm subsidy type programs that would bring some cash into, uh, into farm pockets, but also general relief agencies like FERA that uh, employed farmers in, in construction tasks and road building. Uh, but the, the agency that had uh, the most interesting responsibility was created in 1935 by executive order and that was the Resettlement Administration. And uh, the Resettlement Administration, which uh, became very controversial, uh, had at its prime function the campaign against rural poverty. And many of its programs really went counter to the tradition of American agriculture, resettlement, taking people from, from marginal land, uh, moving them physically into model farm communities. Same thing was done in some ways with, with suburbs. Uh, they were to take marginal land out of production as well as give relief and so on. And uh, uh, the, the Resettlement Administration was reorganized in 1937 as the Farm Security Administration. But uh, of the New Deal programs, I think the, the Resettlement Administration, which turned into the Farm Security Administration, was the most controversial. Uh, it had, uh, uh, well, most of the people, it was headed by Rexford Guy Tugwell, uh, Tugwell uh, a left-wing, liberal, idealist uh, economist from Columbia, who wanted to reshape rural America. He was one of the chief of the, of the social planners. We've got to plan American agriculture, uh, and that will be one of the ways of removing rural poverty. And as part of that, as part of that, and in part because it was under fire as very left-wing, some people called it a communism, because you were moving towards somewhat communal farming, uh, it was attacked, uh, well, it, let's just say that it was the most attacked of all the New Deal agencies. And one of the things that it felt it should do, and, and Tugwell was very strong on this, uh, was that a documentation should be made of rural poverty. I mean, we've got to record not only for history, but to justify this New Deal program. And one way to document was to establish within the resettled, uh, resettlement in, uh, administration an information division. And this was broken down into uh, uh, publication, uh, radio scripts, and radio promotion. And it also had a photographic division and a uh, a documentary uh, division. And uh, Tugwell, uh, as well as Roosevelt, 
thought we've got to document this. We've, we've, in order to justify in a lot of ways what the resettlement administration was doing, let's show the people of the country through photographs what rural poverty is really like. And so beginning, uh, well, really in 35, but getting off the ground in 36, uh, Tugwell uh, appointed as head of the Photographic Historical Division a man by the name of Roy Stryker. Now, Roy Stryker was an economist uh, and a liberal and a friend of Rexford Guy Tugwell, one of the brain trust of the uh, Roosevelt administration. And, uh, but, but Stryker also had a great sense of, of uh, image. And he had done a book in 1925, I think, called American Economic Life and How It Can Be Improved. And he illustrated that with uh, photographic work done by the reformer Jacob Rees, uh, who was a good friend of Theodore Roosevelt, who took pictures of slums and bad conditions. And, and he realized that you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, and if, if you're going to make a statement for attempting to improve rural life uh, or changing the economy, let, let's show people what it's like. And, and so that book uh, caught the attention of, uh, of, uh, of Tugwell, and they were good friends. And then uh, Tug, uh, Stryker had also uh, come from a very strong in, environmental family. And he also, uh, in 1933, came out with a pictorial book called The Roosevelt Year. And so Tugwell was much impressed, although Stryker was not a photographer, but he had a sense of what was good, what images uh, really ought to be used. And so he headed then the photographic division and uh, essentially set up a program where at, which had as its first, uh, first and primary uh, obligation to, go, uh, to hire photographers to go out and document across the country in all the states rural poverty. And he hired some, uh, some well-known photographers like Walker Evans, Dorothea Lang, who had been photographing uh, conditions in California, especially with migrant workers and so on. Uh, Russell Lee, uh, who was one who did photograph North Dakota. Uh, John Vachon, who started out as a messenger who didn't know a thing about a camera, but was given a camera and did some very nice work for Stryker. Uh, and uh, Arthur uh, uh, Rothstein, who also came to North Dakota. And these were young, liberal, sensitive uh, camera people. And he wanted that liberal inclination. And of course, all of them went on to become nationally and internationally recognized photographers. They got their start here. And so in 1936, 1937, uh, this crew started across the country to photograph rural poverty. And it was in 1936-37 that they first came to North Dakota, especially Russell Lee, John Vachon, uh, and Arthur Rothstein. Uh, and so they took pictures across North Dakota and, and other places, and they were looking for the best examples of rural poverty. They weren't out here to photograph smiling people in nice houses. They, they, they had a point to show. Now, now later, Stryker expanded the photographic division or the mission of the photographic division to, to come up over the years with a social, uh, really a, a photographic social history. Uh, they wanted to document the role of the railroad, for example, in American history. So for one year, you get all kinds of railroad tracks and uh, people with the railroad and railroad depots and, and so on. Uh, and in all, the, uh, by then the Farm Security Administration, during uh, 36 through 43, when it was terminated, captured on film about 772,000 photographs documenting not only rural poverty, but documenting American social life. 
And it is commonly uh, accepted that this was the most far-reaching, consequential photographic uh, campaign in all of history. And I was reading a quotation by the director of the New York Museum of Modern Art, who said it was the most outstanding collection ever brought together in American history. Uh, th these people, yes, they were directed to take certain photographs, but they also had a certain license to, to capture what they thought would be, uh, would be good photography. And they were interested in, in shadows and, and clouds, and they were professionals who were after not only the picture, but a, a well-crafted, well-thought-out, sensitive picture. And one of the reasons, reasons why the photographs, as one looks at them, and there are, I, I've looked at those for North Dakota and Minnesota and a smattering of others, uh, and I, I've looked probably at about 7,500 of them, and there are about 3,000 on North Dakota. Uh, you, you get a sense of, uh, boy, these people knew what they were doing. They're, they're, they're uh, excellent photographic work. And part of it, part of the reason for that is they, they came on the scene with the newest equipment. Um, at about this time, the 35 millimeter Leica from Germany and the Roloflex was replacing the old speed graphic. The lenses were faster. You, you could do more with them. Uh, and, and that's why uh, uh, it's excellent photography. In part, it's excellent photography. Uh, there were times when, uh, when Stryker was not pleased. He, he felt that the, he had too many pictures of clouds. So he sent out a memo saying, uh, cut this picture taking of clouds. We have enough clouds. Uh, let's move towards taking pictures of people. And pictures of people were always important, but as you move towards the end of the 30s, there's more of an effort to capture uh, capture people. So it, uh, uh, this New Deal agency uh, uh, was, for the historian, uh, you know, looking back, an extremely successful program. It's not many people could afford film cameras during the 30s. And uh, some of our best pictures of North Dakota, well, the best pictures of North Dakota during the 30s come from the Farm Security Administration collection. Well, you've talked a little bit about the pictures of people. Did any people regard these pictures as distorting reality at all? Were these these are pictures of people who are down and out and yes. should have made people look rather bedraggled, and yet did in fact the pictures do that? Yeah. Well, in North Dakota, being if not the hardest hit, certainly one of the hardest hit. Uh, you, you read the the documentation and the reports of people with federal relief agencies and. Without taking pictures, uh, uh, Ms. Hickok, who, who traveled throughout North Dakota in 33 and 34 and reported to Harry Hopkins, who headed FERA, uh, she puts on, in print uh, a, a picture which is, is one of destitution, of threadbare people down and out, of uh, people that are in, in great want. And so, yes, there, there was this kind of picture of North Dakota. Now, when FSA photographers or Resettlement Administration photographers came to North Dakota, uh, they did emphasize, they did emphasize the, uh, the drab, the gloomy, the down and out uh, aspect. Uh, in 36 and 37, they spent a great amount of time in the hardest hit area of North Dakota, which was Divide County, Williams County, Mackenzie, Stark, uh, the western third of the state, which there was no crop at all. I mean, that was the, the very heart of the Dust Bowl. And in those years of 36, 37, they spent very little or no time in the Red River Valley because the valley uh, had escaped the total drought, it, you know, there's still problems, of course, 
But the, the pictures of 36, 37 uh, tend to emphasize uh, uh, barefoot, ill-clad children standing in front of a very small tar paper shack, uh, people living in dugouts, uh, people sitting in environments that uh, would emphasize the poverty. And, and yes, there was that. But if you were to look at the FSA photographs for 36, 37, you cannot say this is North Dakota. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, in this way it's distorted. Uh, if you were to do a history of North Dakota in 1935, 36, 37, and just use FSA photographs, then you would not present a well-balanced view of North Dakota during that time. Uh, so yes, the photographs can be trusted as historic documents, but they've got to be put in their context. They've got to be put in the context. It's very difficult, even in 1940-42, when things were improving, to, to find pictures of happy people. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the few that we do have in the state, maybe a sample of 200, uh, not many happy faces, and I suppose there weren't many happy faces, but people must have laughed sometime uh, during 36 and 37. Now, you had mentioned that there were some films done. Some agencies did work with, with doing films yes. throughout the country and, and also in North Dakota. That's so. right. Uh, the uh, uh, documentary division of the Resettlement Administration, then the Farm Security Administration, felt that there should be documentaries done. And, and documentary film was really in its infancy. But they, they, uh, they, they wanted to produce high quality films that could be shown in theaters and in, at public meetings and so on that would chronicle the good things that were happening because of the New Deal and because of the work of the Resettlement Administration, as well as other, as well, as well as other New Deal agencies. And uh, the, the key man in this situation was uh, a man by the name of Per Lorentz. Uh, per Lorentz grew up in, in West Virginia. He ha was beginning to see what he called the rape of the land and pollution that early. He, he writes in his personal memoir about his father, who was always fighting to keep the bass alive in polluted streams. And so he, he was very much aware of, uh, of uh, environmental questions. And he was a, a film critic, a film critic on the left. He, he was not a communist, but he, he was on the left politically, and he didn't have much truck with Hollywood and glossing over American life. He was very difficult on tuxedo dance films in the 1930s, of which there were a great many. Uh, and, and he, in 1931, he traveled the country and he was much taken, much taken by the drought. Uh, and uh, we don't know exactly where he went, but he, he was in the, on the Great Plains. And uh, he writes about that, saying that it was just appalling to him how the business of machinery within a short time had so disturbed the Great Plains that the Dust Bowl resulted. And he, he, uh, he went to Washington, and he talked to Rexford Guy Tugwell, who was the administrator of RA and, and FSA, and he said he wanted to make a film on the environment, and the Dust Bowl especially. Well, Tugwell didn't want that. He wanted a film on TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority. Now, the Tennessee Valley Authority was the most, one of the most controversial of New Deal programs because it took the Tennessee Valley, it established public power. You know, the private power companies were not keen on this at all. It wanted to take and, and totally remake a part of the country. 
And, and this, of course, with high idealism, and Tugwell loved that, as well as Roosevelt and others, where you'd take this destitute part of the country, flood ravaged, and make it an ideal valley. And that's exactly what the federal government did through irrigation and use of water and dams, generated hydroelectric power, cheap. Roosevelt uh, was himself very upset that only 6% of Americans had rural electricity. And uh, this, this program came under attack. So Tugwell wanted a film that would justify what was done there. Well, Lorenz didn't. He said, maybe sometime, but I, I, wanted, I want to do something on the environment of the Great Plains. And so uh, Tugwell said, fine. And uh, Lorenz had a, a great sense of uh, proportion, a great sense of place. Uh, and he then set to work on the film that would become The Plow That Broke the Plains, which is still considered a classic and one of the first documentary films. He hired a young crew, uh, men like Paul Strand and uh, uh, Leo Hurwitz and uh, Ralph Steiner. Now, his crew was far to the left. Uh, they were, I suppose we could say, communists. They, they felt capitalism should be overthrown. And they were to work out the script and, uh, and present it to to, uh, to Lorenz. Well, part of the script called for a scene in which you would have millionaires dressed in tuxedos, top hats, smoking cigars, the stereotype, driving tractors, plowing up the Great Plains, uh, placing, placing the whole responsibility for the Dust Bowl on American business, which was in, uh, in trouble because of the Depression and on, on the fat cats of America. Well, Lorenz blew his stack. Uh, that's not what he wanted. And there was great tension in the making of the film, and Lorenz, in the long run, uh, was able to prevail and did, a, it, it did an environmental program, or environmental film, which showed uh, generally the misuse of the land by humans. Uh, and it's hard hitting. It, uh, it is a film which uh, makes its point and clobbers you over the head, the premise being that the whole Great Plains area, including most of North Dakota, should never have been plowed in the first place. It was a gigantic mistake, uh, and that's the premise. But the, it was cattle country, and the plowman came in and, and ruined it. Uh, there's an element underlying theme that these people were greedy. Uh, and that uh, <clears throat> during World War I, we plowed and plowed fence to fence. For defense was the, the government uh, admonition. And uh, that's what farmers in North Dakota and other places did. Much of marginal land in western North Dakota came under cultivation during World War I when prices were high. Farmers did well. 296 wheat, very good. Uh, and, and you plowed up much of the cattle country. And he then, uh, uh, in, a, in a very effective use of the juxtaposition of plowing and harvesting with uh, tanks in World War I, makes the point that this should never have been done. And the reason for the Dust Bowl was, uh, was strengthened because of that. And then he goes into some of the, uh, mo the best Dust Bowl scenes that one can find. Uh, where this was filmed is difficult. He filmed grass in Montana. They did go through North Dakota. Uh, we, we cannot say specifically that things were filmed in North Dakota, but it certainly applies to North Dakota. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the segment on the 30s, is devastating. Dust Bowl, people being driven off the land because of the misuse of the land, because uh, people plowed where they shouldn't have plowed, because they were greedy for more money and more land. Uh, that whole segment is extremely strengthened. And in, in what I've read about 
the plow that broke the planes, mostly done by people in film, have, have missed this. And that is the musical score for the plow that broke the planes is, I think, stupendous. Done by Virgil Thompson, who just died in uh, 1989 at age 92. American composer, uh, who, especially in this, this segment on the 30s, the background is the dust, choking people, uh, dogs panting, a stock in big trouble, and people leaving. You have this almost sub, uh, subliminal advertising. Uh, part of the music is, it goes into, are you sleeping, are you sleeping, Brother John? Well, everybody's sleeping while this was all done. You know, we weren't paying attention. Now, it doesn't hit you over the head, but it's there. And uh, the, the hardest hitting thing in, in the whole film, I think, is uh, when you get into that section where these people are baked out, they're dusted out, over the sound of the doxology. Uh, and there's a, that's a real twist, I think, and a hard-hitting twist that uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow uh, comes across as these people are being wiped out. And then at the very end, the film, uh, focuses on the resettlement administration, which, which is, help, is helping all these farmers driven off the land, helping to resettle them, helping to feed them, helping them to find new homes. So it's a justification and a hard-hitting one of the resettlement administration, which was under heavy attack. So somewhat of a justification for it, but a, uh, a great documentary. It's a propaganda documentary. You have to keep that in mind as, as one looks at it but uh, a great documentary anyway. Now, there were some other films that were actually focused on North Dakota, weren't there? That yes. Were done by other programs. Yes, there were. Uh, and the, uh, the one that exists, and these things keep coming up in attics and, and offices, and uh, I'm sure the National Archives has more, if, if we could uh, dig them out. But there was a film done called the Federal Emergency Relief Administration in North Dakota. Now, FERA, as it's called, was the, the first concerted effort on the part of Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal to bring relief to the country, to keep pe food on the table, to keep a uh, roof over people's houses, uh, over people so they, they wouldn't starve to death. And it, it came early in 1933 and lasted through 1935. And it funneled money into the states, through the states, to employ people in a series of different, uh, wide variety of, uh, of projects that uh, were very good. It not only uh, saved people, but it, it, it improved the physical environment of, of all states and especially North Dakota, which at this time was, we must say, uh, relatively backward as far as, as certain kinds of programs were concerned. Now, for example, in North Dakota, the FERA uh, built uh, 2,300 miles of roads that weren't there before and improved them. It, it, it built 88 tennis courts in a state which just had four or five. It built swimming pools. Uh, it employed uh, people in construction, which was one of the main thrusts. Uh, the Minot Athletic Field, the Jamestown Athletic Field, uh, ice rinks, and so on. Now, most of the uh, most of the jobs for FERA were oriented towards men. Uh, for for the most part, men were head of household, and you had to be a head of household to receive this kind of government employment relief at which you could make, depending on your, your status of poverty, 38 to $40 a month. Uh, but there were uh, programs for women, too, uh, throughout the state. Most, uh, most counties and cities had canning projects, which women ran. 
Women were involved in mattress factories, for that kind of thing. Women were involved also in massive sewing projects, uh, making clothes for uh, those that had no clothes. Uh, so it, it employed a, a great many North Dakotans, probably about 10 percent women, 90 percent men. Uh, and the, a couple of points to be remembered about this, and this is brought out in, in, in the film, which we'll mention in a minute, that the New Deal becomes very statistical. Well, we didn't keep, as a country, statistical records before really 19, well, 1933. We didn't know how many people were unemployed in 1932. There were no records. Well, uh, the film points out that it wants to get across to you how many people were employed, how many mattresses were made, how many child's uh, diapers were manufactured, how many blankets and so on, how many, how many bushels of potatoes were canned, uh, and all this kind of thing. Uh, and part of that, of course, is to show people what, what was being done. Uh, so FERA was very important to North Dakota. It uh, employed at any single time 190,000 heads of household. Now, when you're looking at a population of 650,000, that is indeed many, a high percent of the people in the state as heads of households being employed. Uh, again, North Dakota received much more than the national share of FERA because of the because of the drought that, that uh, devastated the state in 34. Um, North Dakota received at, uh, $10 million in, in federal money for FERA. The state of New York, with a much larger population, received $8 million. Montana, $2 million. Minnesota, $5 million. So per capita, North Dakota received more than any other state in the Union. Now, the film brings this across. It, it's an hour film, a silent film with subtitles, uh, I suppose, for economy. A man by the name of Paul, uh, Paul Steiner went across the state filming projects, wanting to project the positive side. Uh, and this is a little in contrast to FSA. Uh, this is upbeat. Uh, this is progress. These are people being employed, projects being done. An emphasis on swimming pools and young children splashing and swimming and smiling. See, the New Deal's bringing happiness uh, to the American people and employment. And it is a, a wonderful record, and I, the only record we have of this kind of thing. Many people throughout North Dakota doing uh, positive things, whether it's building privies, uh, whether it's stuffing mattresses, people-oriented, uh, but it's positive. Uh, and I suppose in that film are maybe 30 or 40 projects. And it's the only existing film of projects. And I learned from the film some projects I'd never heard of before. So it was a Upbeat in part, or maybe totally, who knows, uh, because of the coming election, I think, in 1936. Uh, it, it starts out by saying, under our President Franklin Roosevelt, we have made tremendous progress, and uh, we are uh, attacking the problems of rural poverty and so on. Well. With an election coming, uh, this uh, this was this was all right for Roosevelt to have a movie that would go around the state showing, my gosh, we've employed 190,000 at any one time, and we've spent eight million dollars here, and look how we've improved the Linton Park, the Wapaton swimming pool, the Minot Athletic Stadium, the uh, Williston swimming pool, and so on. So uh, this is a, a and, and the quality of the filming is, uh, is uh, uh, not a documentary quality. It's just somebody with a camera out there tr documenting the, uh, the films that, uh, or the, the projects that would be 
made into a film. So it's a, uh, it's, I think you'd have to say it's a glowing account of a, of a uh, New Deal program that was very important to North Dakota. Uh, and it does show that here we want to, we want to, uh, want to picture on film the positive side of physical uh, improvement as well as the emotional improvement of people's lives by giving them work. So it, it's a little different kind of film. What was the total time frame then that, that you could say that documentary film and photography was done? You've talked about some different changes in focus over uh, at least a decade. Yeah, sense. well, I, I suppose we could say that uh, uh, the, the New Deal uh, filming projects really began with the New Deal. Uh, or shortly after it started, because FERA ran 33 to 35, and, and, and some of the footage was shot in 34. Uh, some of it was shot in 30, 35. Then you had the Resettlement Administration doing 35, and Farm Security up with documentaries and stills up to 43. And uh, almost all the New Deal, agency, uh, New Deal agencies had I don't want to call it their propaganda arm, but their public relations, and this is in part public relations. Uh, you, you, as Roosevelt said, uh, you know, the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. He saw the, the psychological uh, aspect of, of depression, and that you had to convince people that things weren't as bad, that things were being done to lift their spirits. and. Uh, we know that uh, President Roosevelt became a master at using the radio. I mean, he, uh, he sensed that these uh, relatively new, although film wasn't new by that time, but radio was, uh, th these relatively new ways of reaching people were important. He, ha he had that sense. And uh, other, other agencies did the same kind of thing. Uh, whether in print or rather in film. The, uh, the Public Works Administration that built the larger things like post offices, most North Dakota post offices are built by uh, PWA, uh, they, uh, they had their own photographers taking pictures of what they were doing. Uh, and those pictures and what they were doing came out in a, in a, a sizable volume, which was distributed all across the country uh, in uh, oh, about 1938. Here, here's what we're doing. And uh, so the uh, Roosevelt and the New Deal and the, uh, the people working the New Deal like Tugwell and, and, uh, uh, and others like Ickes and so on, there was a sense that we've got to record this. And of course, for the historian, it was, uh, it was wonderful that they did have this sense. Self-serving, of course, but uh, for the uh, historian who uses these things wisely, a tremendous uh, documentation of the country. Okay, well, I would like to thank you for joining us today, Dr. Tweeten, to talk with us some about the history of documentary film and photography in North Dakota, and I'd like to thank the those of us in the audience who have joined us. Again, this is Conversations in North Dakota History, sponsored by the State Historical Society of North Dakota. Mm -hmm.